Well, I just uh, want to say thank you, first of all, for letting me be here and meeting so many of you that I haven't seen in a long time because all of us have gotten lower than we used to be. But that's in your mind, not in your heart. And so I want to say thank you very much for inviting me today. And I just want to give testimony to the faithfulness of God in answering prayer. Amen. And I could talk about a lot of political things, but that's not the issue. The issue is what happens in your life every day. And we talk about prayer. And I think uh, many times we're prone to talk about praying for the country and praying for this, that, and the other. But what about our own prayer life? What's happening to me? What's happening to you? And so I just want to share a few things with you that have indicated to me how very important it is. And if I turn to the scripture, and I know I have 30 minutes, I'm going to talk fast, and you listen fast, all right? <laughs> and one of my favorite verses about Jesus is Mark 1, verse 35. In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left his house, went away to a secluded place, and was praying there. And of course, the disciples in interrupted him. I was fortunate enough to um, deliver newspapers when I was a kid growing up, which meant I had to get up at 5.30 every morning and take off, and I delivered newspapers for, I guess I had about 125 customers. So it got me up early. Well, to tell you the truth, I was a little afraid of the dark, uh, especially where I delivered papers. So I just decided, well, <clears throat> I'm going to pray, just trust God. Well, what was happening, and I didn't even realize that God was working in my life to build a tremendous habit, to get up early in the morning and talk to God. And if I didn't gain anything else from that paper route, I gained the most important thing I could possibly have learned. So that was a good start for me. And when I would read this scripture, I would say, well, Lord, that's what I'm doing. I'm getting up early and I'm going to a quiet place and it wasn't very quiet at 5.30 in the morning. But I think of how many times God saved me from accidents because in the afternoon I had to deliver newspapers again. And so I was in and out cars. I was on the, the, uh, the main street. And I remember one uh, time I stepped out in front of this car and this wheel screeched and this lady, <laughs> she stood on her porch, she said, Charles Stanley, don't get killed in front of my house. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, thank you very much for your kind concern. <laughs> but um, those early years were good years for me. And what I've learned is this. Sometimes we think, well, well if, if, I just, if I had a little bit more, sometimes not having enough is the best thing that can happen. Whatever drives us to our knees to pray and ask God's direction and help, that's good. And so I think about those early years when uh, it was just my mother and myself for a while. And uh, if somebody said, well, if you need this and need that, what do you do? Well, the only thing I knew was to ask God. So I could not thank him enough for teaching me the importance of prayer being the most important thing in my life. And I wouldn't say that to brag. I'm just saying I had to. If I had had some other alternative, I probably would have chosen that. But God knew what he was doing. So when I look back over the years and think about how God has operated in the midst of all that, when I went to seminary, I'd been there one year. I was into my second year, and I was down praying over in the corner of my our living room. And I remember what God said to me so clearly. Whatever you accomplish in life, you'll accomplish on your knees. Not by your intelligence, not by your schooling, not by your training, not by this, only on your knees. I never forgot it. And that was sort of a real mark for me because God was saying to me, don't expect to be this, that, and the other. I want you to pray. So I finally figured out, well, Lord, I may not learn to preach, but at least I can learn to pray and nobody will know whether I learned it or not. Except <laughs> you and myself. And so I just said out, God, teach me to pray and teach me how to pray and Teach me how to trust you. So I look back over the years and see how God's done that. And I would just um, mention a few things to you that uh, how God has worked in my own life. And um, I was in Bartow, Florida. I'd been there only 11 months. And I was um, in Virginia here preaching a revival. And the Lord was blessing us. And I'd come back each night and I'd think, what's wrong? I knew something wasn't right. So I confessed and repented of everything I possibly could, but 
Three days went by and I'd be given up. I said, Lord, what are you trying to say to me? So nothing happened. I came back the next night. I took a legal pad and I drew a circle in five lines. I said, well, it must be one of these things. So I wrote down at the top of what it might be and uh, I went to bed. I came back the next night and I said, Lord, what are you saying to me? It's like the Lord said to me, I'm going to move you. I thought, well, two or three years from now, where would that be? And so when I said, when, I can still see this as good as I can see you. In front of me, and I was kneeling in front of my bed, in front of me was this big screen in the bottom left-hand corner to the right top in bold black letters, September. I said, well, you don't usually tell me things that far ahead of time. And so I came back the next night. It's like God was anywhere, <coughs> anywhere to be seen or heard or felt. So I came home and I went, asked the Lord to show me what he was talking about because I'd only been at this church 11 months and I was happy as I could be. September the 30th of the same year, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, which was God's way of saying to me, you listen to me, you trust me, don't try to figure it out. I would never have done that. I would never have moved. I didn't want to move. In fact, I complained all the way to Atlanta, Georgia. I didn't want to go to Atlanta, Georgia. And for two reasons, I didn't agree with the past. He was a rank liberal at that time. He's in heaven now, so I talk about it. <laughs> and, uh, and I just, I didn't want to go back to the big city. But simply to say that God is faithful to direct us in any situation, circumstance, if we listen to him. And sometimes people have the idea, well, in my job, I'm not a preacher. I don't do this. And it doesn't make any difference what you are. Talking to God, listening to him, uh, and trusting him about everything is what life's all about. And I think, personally, we are better off if we do not have a lot of things we'd like to have, if we don't have things as simply as we'd like to have them, or things work out the way we... Whatever drives you to your knees is good. I believe that's true. And I think Jesus had that as a priority in his life because all you have to do is read that 35th verse. Early in the morning, a great while before day, he went away to a quiet place talking to the Father. So I'll simply ask you a question, and that is, would you say that um, that's a priority in your life? A real priority? Nobody knows that but you. It's nobody's business but yours. But is it a real priority in your life to talk to God? We can talk about prayer, but when it comes to talking to the Father, bringing everything to Him, asking for direction for our life, then that's what it's really all about. And we can say that we pray, we can pray for our nation, but I believe this. My prayers for the nation or anything else, the weight of that prayer is going to be determined by how much time I spend with Him by myself talking about me and what he wants to do in my own life. It is the most important thing in a person's life, spending time with the Lord, talking to him, being quiet, watching him work in your life. So when I think about how God's worked in my own life, and I went to First Baptist Church Miami, I, as I, I mean First Baptist Church Atlanta, I've been to Miami First Baptist also, but uh, it was a difficult time for me. Seven men ran everything, and they let me know that real fast. I, ca I came as an associate pastor. So I'd been there about six months or so. We had a meeting, and in the process of having the meeting, these seven men and myself, I was just invited to it since I was an associate pastor. Uh, they were trying to make a decision. They talked and talked and talked, and I said, well, why don't we pray about it? And here's what I'll never forget. This fellow was an attorney. He said, this is God's, this is, this is business, leave God out of this. Well, they drew the battle line right there when they said that. So, and they meant it. And so, when I started talking about prayer, they got very uneasy, very uncomfortable, and so the war started. And for 18 months, they did their best to get rid of me. I, I spoke in tongues, they said. I mean, I, they named everything you can name to get somebody to dislike someone. So I just kept trusting God and asking him to give me direction. Well, in all of that, which was a big fight, really, 
I learned one of the greatest lessons. And I think about prayer. Oftentimes, you learn what God wants you to learn has nothing to do with what you're talking to Him about. And so that's why it's not just a matter of praying for your needs or whatever they might be, but asking God to give you direction for your life. And I learned something when they were saying all kind of difficult things about me, and I was, it was getting to me a little bit, and I remember one day I was praying, I said, Lord, you have to show me how, how to handle this. I don't like this. In fact, I, I'm, my, my dislike for some of these folks is getting strong. <laughs> so I didn't say hate. But I didn't say, so I remember what the Lord said to me. You wanna, if you want to win this battle, this is the way you win it. You see everything you hear, everything they do to you, everything they require of you is coming from me, not them. Well, I had to think about that for a moment. You see it, it's coming from me. And therefore, they'll keep you from being bitter, resentful, hostile, angry, or ha becoming a real problem. You just see everything coming from me, trust me, listen to me, and watch me work. Well, we had a big business meeting, and uh, I became the pastor, but they were still hanging around. And uh, so I started praying for, for, it was about 400 of them. I, I started praying for God to remove them. Well, you know, when you want God to do something, you want him to do it now, usually. And so I did. And um, so in January, so about three months had gone by, in January they were, they were still there. And I was just telling God, you got to do something. So I called a business meeting, a surprise business meeting, and uh, didn't tell anybody until we, we all got there that night. And uh, so I asked the church to give me full a re full uh, re responsibility for uh, all the affairs of the church, including what the deacons had done, everybody had done. And I had an old army colonel who was my superintendent uh, of the Sunday school, so the two of us. So the process of doing so, naturally they didn't like that, and they came in there ready to fight. So um, this guy said he'd like to speak. I said, well, come on up here. So he stood to my left. and. I would never have thought of this, but I've been praying for God to remove these people. So he got to talking, and he said, Stanley, if you don't watch out, you're going to get hurt. So he backhands me and hits me in the jaw. And so my first response was, oh, mm. it's like the Lord said, it's over. You won. It's over. In a week, they were all gone. Now, I prayed for them to be gone, but that's not what God used. He used one of their people who could not hold this temple and who was a very ungodly sort of a guy and uh, so I think about we pray and ask God to do things the way we think that ought to be done when he's going to do it the way he wants to be done and nothing would have made all of them leave like being embarrassed by being categorized by people who were, uh, were literally fighting with the pastor and so I look back and see how simple God's ways are. And we pray for one thing, and he does something else which is better than we're praying for. Or maybe we don't pray at the right time or the right place or whatever. God knows exactly what we need. But the issue is, is, is that a habit in our life? Is it a habit in our life to start the day with him? We don't know what the day's gonna be like. And we hear sermons on it, and we this, that, and the other. But in your own life, you ask yourself the question, how important to me personally is my relationship with Jesus, my, my relationship to the work he's called me to? Where, where is, the, how, how is it really important? How important is it? Because here's what I believe. I believe that you and I, for the most part, we will get by the best we can with as little praying as we can until we have to. Now, if you just think about it for a moment, we, we, as long as we can get by, everything's fine. It's when God puts the pressure on us and we can't get by, then we say, okay, Lord, what do you want us to do? And God makes it so simple. I just want you to spend time with me listening to me because nobody's going to tell us what we know and ought to know about ourselves like God's going to tell us. And so I think it's the most important thing in our life. And I think about the different ways we learn that question and that uh, truth. 
And um, I think about um, some things we pray about. Well, one thing, for example, one Easter, I was preparing a sermon, and um, um, usually by Thursday I'll have an outline. Well, Thursday came, I didn't have an outline. And so Friday came, and no outline. And so I was tempted to pull up a sermon I'd preached before on the resurrection. And if you've been preaching resurrection sermons as many years as I have, you got a lot of sermons back there. <laughs> so it's like God said no. Mm -mm. So God said no. So I thought, okay, it's Friday, Lord, and Sunday's coming. That's right. And uh, so uh, Friday came, and I didn't have a sermon. Saturday morning, I reminded God that tomorrow was Easter. We'd have two services, and I was going to look really bad if I didn't have a sermon. In fact, I even accused him of not giving me a message, and I'd have to confess that. No, that didn't work. So this is the truth. Saturday night came, and I'm saying, God, you've got to get with the plan. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, have, I don't have much time. So out of desperation, and that's a good place to be at times, out of desperation, I got on my face before the Lord, and I stretched out, and I told him, I said, Lord, only you can answer my problem. Only you can give me a message. So now watch it. This is what I want you to see. I'm praying for one thing. If you ask me what the need is, the need is that I have a message for Sunday. That wasn't the need at all. Because when I got on my knees and started asking God for the message, here's what he said to me. It had nothing to do with preaching. He said, you must never ask for one penny on the air for either radio or television. You must trust me and let me decide how far and wide this ministry goes, but you're never to ask for money. That had nothing to do with Easter morning. <laughs> but you know what, as soon as I wrestled with that, and I finally said, okay, God. I couldn't write fast enough. I got up, and I, I couldn't write the outline fast enough. All I needed was an outline. I couldn't wait till Sunday, Sunday morning. And the issue is, sometimes we get caught up in one thing when God has something entirely different to say. And that was a very important point to me for the simple reason that uh, I would Back in those days, and that happened when some of your friends and mine were asking for money and on every program on the air, they were asking for money for this, that, and it was like God said, no, must never ask for one penny. And I don't think we have ever had an opportunity we ever had to say no to, and my CEO, uh, Philip, is here. We've never asked God for anything and then tried to figure out some way to finance it. But asking, Lord, you show us what you'd have us to do. We're going to trust you for the finances. And I won't even tell you how blessed we have been. He said, I'll decide how far and what it goes. So if you'd have asked me the question, well, would you, would you just trust how far and what this ministry is going? Would you just trust that into God's hands? I would probably say, well, I would, but there's a few things I need to do. God said, no, you preach the gospel and leave all that to me. So that's what we try to do. And um, I'll give you one other story, because you have had lunch and you don't need a whole long sermon. But um, we had bought a whole bunch of property downtown. And uh, in fact, we bought enough that when we sold it, it was worth $55 million. And we just, we started with buying a $125,000 lot. And this was so many years ago, that $125,000 wouldn't be anything today, but then there's a lot of money. And the Lord just showed me if our folks were going to learn to trust him, uh, they had to trust him with something they could, that was tangible. So I said, okay. So we bought a, an empty parking lot a block away from us. It had nothing to do with the church, for $125,000. And I said, now, I want, us to, I want us to trust God for the money. And so we're not going to borrow any money. And don't even ask me. Now, most churches fire you for this. I said, don't even ask me what it's for. Just trust me. Just trust me to buy this parking lot. So for some reason, by the grace of God, they did. And we got enough money and we bought it. Then a few months went by and something else came. Anyway, this property came on just time after time after time. We kept buying a piece of here and a piece there. And it's right downtown in uh, Atlanta, right next to uh, where the Fox State is. 
And so uh, we bought everything from Peachtree Street to the expressway. Nobody said a word. Nobody had asked anybody about what was happening. We bought all that property. And then the real estate folks said, who has put all of this property together? How did we miss this? And they went wild. I never said a word. But one guy held out on us. One fellow right behind the church, he had a small building, but we had everything else in that block, and he wouldn't sell it. So I went, his name was Cuba, Mr. Cuba. So I said, Mr. Cuba, what about selling us? That just, you just name your price. No, I don't want to talk about it. I'm not selling this property. I said, okay. Went back to see him again. He said, no. He said, no, you don't really need to come back and see me anymore. I said, okay, which is good. I'm glad he told me that. So we would usually have our prayer meeting with the staff on Monday morning, and uh, we met in a certain room, and so we were praying that morning, and I'd already prayed, and we had prayed about that property and so forth, and this is how God works. Somebody's praying, and I'm looking out the window, and, um, and I'm looking out the window, and I see this building. I'm going to get myself in here praying. So... I didn't pray very long, just like the Lord said to me. You want that building? I said, yes, Lord. Well, what did, what did Joshua do? I thought, no. I'm not going to do that. So I said, uh, this whole staff will think I'm crazy. It's like God said, do what I tell you. So when I finished, I said, well, let me tell you how God's working. Starting next Monday, we're going to march around the block. <laughs> not, not the building, the block. He's in the middle of the block. We're going to march around the block but one time, and we're going to come back and pray. And here's the issue. You absolutely must not tell anybody what's going on. Nobody. If you do, I'm going to fire you. That's how important it is. Nobody can talk. We marched around that block for six weeks on Monday. And I remember the seventh week that it was so cold, we had scarves, we had overcoats, and it has 12 guys walking around this block. And we, we had done it for six weeks, and nobody said a word. Nobody asked anything about it. Nobody, you'd have thought it didn't happen. On the seventh uh, week, we marched around it seven times. Came back, said, they said, well, God hadn't done anything. I said, well, just, just trust him. So about two months went by, and I'm sure they thought, mm -hmm, we made a fool out of ourselves, and nothing's <laughs> happened. About two months went by, Mr. Cuba called me. He said, Dr. Stanley, are you still interested in, interested in this property? I said, well, I might be. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got it at a good price, and God provided every single thing. So I'll just give you a few examples of how God works if we let him work, if we give him an opportunity. We could have borrowed the money, bought that building, and paid the bank interest. We bought all that property, we never paid the bank a bit of interest, and so when we sold it, we, we did very, very well. But it was a result of people, teach, uh, people learning to trust God. My whole goal was not to buy property. My whole goal was to learn to trust God and then one piece we bought was almost $3 million. And um, so they were getting a little jittery about that. This is how God works. What I want you to see is this is God's doings, not my doings. This, we had about a million and a half, maybe a little bit more than that. And the time was coming, we had to pay the rest of it. So on Sunday morning, I preached the first service. And, and um, I knew how much more we need, but I never mentioned it. I said, you know, the deadline is Monday, and we're about a million dollars behind. But we're going to trust God. And I was really having to trust Him. So at the end of the service, I gave the invitation, and a few folks came forward. And then this young couple came up, and uh, they said, uh, we don't have anything to give because somebody drove up to our house last week and emptied our house, stole everything we had. And I could tell she was pregnant. And so... Um, he pulls out this wedding ring. And he said, so we, we want to give, this is all we've got to give, we want to give this. I said, no way. You, you can't give me 
that I said, you're going to have, to have a baby and you, t you don't have anything, you've lost everything and you're going to give it up. God told us to do it. Well, so I finally said, okay. I took the ring, dropped it in my pocket. Second service, at the end of the service, I gave the invitation and while I, was, I said, by the way, I reached in my pocket, pulled out this wedding ring. I said, at the first service, this young couple and I told that story. And I said, uh, which was a real matter of sacrifice. And so I said, you might think about that. Put it back in my pocket, gave the invitation. So help me God. They came down both aisles. People came out of the balcony. They were giving money, rings, bracelets, cars, houses, and boats. And I mean, anyway, we got all that we needed when we needed it. We had to cash it in, of course, and the bank realized that. And so we got more than the, the uh, three million, three, almost three million dollars that we needed. But what I want you to see is this. When you pray, you let God do it. I would never have thought about that. I, the last thing I would do is take somebody's wedding ring. Mm -hmm. And so God knew somebody emptied their house. Now, emptying their house was a terrible thing. Now, emptying their house was a good thing. It's a good thing from God's perspective. And I think what happens is when you and I pray right, we begin to see God doing things that we think we did or somebody else did. God knows exactly what it takes. Somebody's stealing everything they had. By the way, we helped them to get it all back. Stealing everything they had, except their ring, sacrificing, giving it to the Lord's work, and just and asking nothing in return. And God took that thought. Well, their simple obedience to God was worth over a million dollars in about five days. You can't figure that out. That's why I think we miss lots of blessings in life because we're prone to figuring it out. And I, we all are. And that's where we grow up. And we think, if, well, if it doesn't work out, then we won't do it. You do it and you trust God. And so when I look back over the years and I'll be 60, I'll be, <laughs> don't my way. I'll, I'll be 85 in a, a few months. And I'm grateful to God for that. And I think all these years, the greatest lesson I've ever learned is to trust God, don't try to figure him out, just trust him and watch him work. And that's one of my favorite phrases, trust God and watch him work. Because he's always willing and ready, and God never comes up short, he never comes up late. He's always on time to do whatever needs to be done. So I would just leave that with you and simply hope you'll think about it in your own life and ask yourself the question, what is it I'm trying to do that maybe God wants to do? Or am I going in a direction that is just absolutely natural and normal, but it isn't God's direction? Am I asking for something that God doesn't want because he's got something better? And what I've found over all these years, whatever I ask him for, he didn't provide. He provided something better. And I think that's the way God operates. And he takes great delight in disappointing us with what we ask in order to give us something far better than we could imagine. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, I want to introduce uh, the fellow who's my right arm at In Touch and who has uh, done such a fantastic job. And um, Philip, if you'll stand just for a moment. And um, he's my CEO. <laughs> and uh, I have been praying for God to send us a right fellow for quite some time. And I invited him and a friend of mine to Thanksgiving lunch. And I had no idea that I'd talk about the position because I, the person in that position did not belong there and he left. So I had nobody. I simply invited him because I, I thought a lot of him. And, uh, but not in this position. We're sitting at Thanksgiving lunch and um, we're eating, and I thought, God, you, you know what I need. Here I am on Thanksgiving Day having somebody here, and we're fellowshipping, and this position is awesomely important. It's like God said to me, he's sitting across the table. <laughs> I thought, no, because I knew he was about 30 years old then, weren't you, somewhere thereabouts? And uh, he was working somewhere else before he came to work for us, and he was just working 
uh, in another position much lower than that. But he said right in front of me. It's like God says, there he is. Trust me. I have one thing to say. Be alert to the voice and the movement of God. Don't figure you've got it all figured out. If you will trust him and obey him, you will always come out better. Not sometime, not every time, all the time. That's who he is. Thank you very much.